Okay, so this is the continuation of the free fall lecture. In the previous portion of this lecture, I introduced you to the following kinematics equations that describe an object in free fall. Position as a function of time and velocity. Incidentally, in the previous lecture, for the other classes, physics, honors physics, and AP physics, you also saw a third equation. That third equation is not important for our purposes here. Instead, for this class, we'll just take a look at these two expressions. That is position and velocity as functions of time. Now recall, for an object in free fall, as long as we neglect air resistance, that all objects fall with the same constant acceleration, regardless of their weight in the absence of air resistance, that's the acceleration due to gravity called g. It's equal to 9.8 meters per second squared. So these are the same two equations that we saw for horizontal situations involving one-dimensional motion with constant acceleration, but now written in terms of the vertical direction, hence the variable y as opposed to x, and also specifically with the acceleration downwards of g, 9.8 meters per second squared. Downwards is usually considered to be the negative direction, therefore you see a negative sign associated with these two terms, the acceleration terms in the respective equations. Once again, these are the same two equations as we saw earlier for horizontal situations, now applied for situations for an object in free fall. So we'll take a look at two basic examples over the course of this lecture. Go ahead and copy down the first of those examples into your notes now. I'll read that example to you. An object is dropped from rest at a height of 50 meters in part A, how much time is necessary to reach the ground, and in part B, what is the velocity of the object when it reaches the ground. So I'm going to employ the basic method for solving a physics problem that you've already seen in previous lectures here. The first thing to do, if you recall, is to draw a simple diagram. Okay, so right here is the ground. Okay, now specifically because the ground is a good point of reference, typically what we do in free fall situations is we think of the ground as the origin. Okay, and then we have our object which is dropped from rest at a height of 50 meters above the ground. So right here is the object, and because it is dropped from rest, its initial velocity, vy0, is equal to zero. Now it does have an initial position. The initial position called y naught is not equal to zero. Here in this case, it's 50 meters above the ground. Remember once again that we consider the ground to be the origin. So right here is the initial position vector y naught of the object that's given to us is 50 meters. Okay, and then we release the object from rest. It then falls to the ground. As it falls to the ground, it has the acceleration of g downwards like so. Okay, now because at the end of the problem it does reach the ground, at the final moment or instantaneous instant, if you will, that the object is in free fall, its final position y is equal to zero. Now when you encounter basic free fall problems, sometimes they'll be phrased in the following way. For example, what is the velocity of the object the instant that it strikes the ground, the instant prior to striking the ground, etc. Well, all of those phrasings actually mean the same thing because the word instant literally applies to a non-measurable amount of time. So it's the last possible moment that the object is in free fall, therefore the final position is equal to zero, the final position y. Afterwards, it hits the ground and it's no longer in free fall, it's a different physical situation then. Okay, and now, when it does reach the ground, it does so in an unknown amount of time t, and it has a final velocity here, v sub y. So, once again, you begin by drawing a diagram, writing down the known quantities, and writing down the unknown quantities. And now we write down our relevant equations, which I already have done, of course. These are the kinematics equations for an object in free fall, and now we begin to solve for whatever it is that we're looking for. In this case, we're looking for the time t and the velocity v sub y. Okay, now let's begin to simplify the equations. Let's take a look at, for example, the position equation here. Notice that two things in the equation are equal to zero, the final position y and the initial velocity. So if I set this equal to zero and this equal to zero, then this equation simplifies and become the following. This expression here, and now if you look at the expression carefully, the only unknown is the time t, which I can now solve for. 
So to solve for the time t, I'm going to take this term here and add it to the other side of the equation. Like so. And now we cross multiply by the 2 and the g over to the right hand side, and then we'll take the square root. So if you do those couple of minor mathematical steps together, you end up with the following expression here for the time t. Now, of course, when taking a square root here, technically speaking, for mathematics, there is a plus or a minus associated with this. In this case, we only use the plus because we're talking about time. And at this point, I start to plug in my numbers. When I do plug in for g, I plug in positive 9.8 meters per second squared. The negative sign for downwards is already taken care of in the equations themselves. So you just plug in the magnitude. So I have the square root now of the entire total here, which is 2 times 50 and then divided by 9.8. Take the square root of that, and it ends up being about 3.2 seconds. So it takes 3.2 seconds for the object to fall down to the ground. Okay, then lastly, in part B of the problem, we'll now calculate its final velocity. That's V sub Y. We'll do so from the velocity equation. The first thing that we do, however, is we simplify the equation by plugging in the initial velocity as at zero. Once again, recall that the object is dropped from rest. So when I plug in zero into that expression, that expression then simplifies to become the following. Minus gt, the minus sign, of course, comes from the equation itself. And now I just take the time that I found earlier, 3.2 seconds, multiply it by g, and I end up then with about negative 31.3 or so meters per second. The negative sign here means that the final velocity vector v sub y point downwards, as is obvious here on my diagram, the final speed of the object would be 31.3 meters per second. Okay, now let's take a look at the second example. The second example is a basic problem where we begin by taking the object and initially throwing it upwards. And then we're going to calculate out a big couple of basic quantities associated with that. Go ahead and copy that example down into your notes. I need to move my file so I can see it here on my screen. Okay, let me also erase the previous problem as well. Once again, however, I'm going to keep my free fall kinematics equations here on the board because I'm going to be using them in this example as well. Okay, so here's the reading of the problem. An object is thrown upwards from the ground with an initial speed of 20 meters per second. In part A, what is the maximum height reached? And then in part B, we'll see what happens when it ultimately returns back down to the ground and also what its final speed will be. But we'll get to that later. So for now, for part A, let's diagram it out in the following way. Okay, so here's the ground. Once again, we consider that to be the origin. But in this case, the object is thrown upwards from the ground. This then means that relative to the origin, the object's initial position, y0, is equal to zero. And then it has right here an initial velocity, vy0, upwards, that's given to us as 20 meters per second. And then when the object does reach its maximum height, at the instant that it does reach its maximum height, its velocity at that instant is zero. So right here is the object when it reaches its maximum height, and at that moment, at that instant, its final velocity, v sub y, is equal to zero. And then we have two things that are unknown. The first thing that's unknown is the final vertical position, y. That's the maximum height reached, of course. And then the time, t, is unknown. Incidentally, of course, we know the acceleration downwards is g, 9.8 meters per second squared. Okay, mathematically, this example is a little bit different than the previous example. Here's then how we begin. Notice that we are given the final velocity here of the object, v sub y being equal to zero, when the object does reach its maximum height. So let's actually begin by looking at the velocity equation first. That's this expression here. In this expression, the left-hand side of the equation is equal to zero. Let's go ahead and plug that in, like so. And now if you look at the expression carefully, you'll notice that the only unknown here is the time t, which I can now solve for. But when I'm solving for the time t here, it's not by using the position equation like in the previous example. In this case, it's the velocity equation. So let's go ahead and solve for the t by first of all moving the gt to the other side, like so. And now we just divide by g to the other side to get the time t by itself, like so. And at this point, we plug in. So I have in the numerator 20 meters per second and then divided by 9.8 meters per second squared. This ends up being about 2.04 seconds. 
So it takes 2.04 seconds for the object to reach its maximum height. Okay, and then to calculate the maximum height, at this point, let's now just plug everything here into the position equation. There's no algebra to perform here, but I do have all the values now in the right-hand side of the expression. So zero plus 20 times 2.04 minus one half times 9.8 times 2.04 squared. So just plug everything in. Okay, I'm gonna go ahead and do so here in my calculator. So y naught is zero, and then we have 20, and then multiply by 2.04, minus 1 half times 9.8, times 2.04 squared. And this ends up being about 20.4 meters. So that's the maximum height reached. Okay, now in the remainder of the example, let's then see what happens when the object falls back down to the ground. In order to calculate this out, let's just treat this like the first example from earlier. Let me, by the way, move my file for just a moment. Okay, so now let's go ahead and take a look at parts B and C. Okay, parts B and C are going to go together, and as I said, we'll treat parts B and C of the problem exactly like we did earlier, the first example. What we'll do is we'll take the object and we'll drop it from rest. So the initial velocity, VY0, is going to be zero, and then relative to the ground, once again, remember that the ground is considered the origin, so let me write that out. We begin with an initial position, Y0, equal to the maximum height that we calculated earlier in part A of the problem. 20.4 meters. Okay, and then we drop the object down to the ground. So at the last possible instant that it's in free fall, its final position y is at zero. This takes place in an unknown amount of time t. And we have here a final velocity v sub y that's unknown. Once again, the acceleration is downwards at g. And now, just like we did in the earlier example, let's actually begin here part b of the problem by looking at the position equation. So here's the position equation once again, and for part B of the problem, two things are zero. The final position Y and the initial velocity VY naught. So plug in zero and zero here into the expression, and it then simplifies to become the following. Like so, just like it did in the earlier example. And now let's go ahead and solve for the time T, which is unknown. So move the 1 half gt squared to the other side first. Cross multiply by the 2 and the g to the other side, and then take the square root. When doing so, you end up with this expression here. So notice that this expression here for the time is different than this expression here for the time to go upwards, because this was derived by using the velocity equation. This one here was derived by using the position equation. But watch what happens when I plug in the numbers. So now when I do plug in the numbers, we have the square root of 20, or excuse me, 2 times 20.4, and then divided by 9.8, take the square root of all of that, and lo and behold, it ends up being, once again, 2.04 seconds. So it takes 2.04 seconds to reach its maximum height, and 2.04 seconds to fall back down to the ground. The reason for that is because what you're seeing here is symmetry, specifically the symmetry about the vertex of a parabola that describes the position of this object as a function of time. I'll sketch out that graph, by the way, in just a few moments after I finish part C of the example. So now to find part C, what we're asked to find here is the final velocity v sub y the instant prior to hitting the ground. In order to do so, we'll use the velocity equation. In the velocity equation, we're dropping the object from rest, so this term here is equal to zero. So the velocity equation simplifies to become the following. And now we plug in the following, negative and then 9.8 times 2.04 seconds. Okay, so 9.8 times 2.04, and lo and behold, this ends up being negative 20 meters per second. So when I throw the object upwards, it leaves my hand at a speed of 20 meters per second, but it also returns to my hand at a speed of 20 meters per second. Once again, you're seeing symmetry here in this problem symmetry with respect to the velocity as a function of time. In order to see these symmetries that I've been describing here as I've completed this example, let me go ahead and just sketch out two basic graphs for this example. Okay, 
so for this example, let me sketch out the following first. Time in seconds, and then the velocity in terms of meters per second as a function of time. For an object in free fall, we always have a line, and the line has a slope that's equal to g downwards at 9.8 meters per second squared. Like in the previous portion of today's lecture on free fall, you end up with the following graph for an object that is thrown upwards. Okay, and then here are the various points on this line. Okay, first of all, we're launching upwards here from the ground with an initial velocity of 20 meters per second. At the end of the problem, when it returns back down to the ground, its velocity, as we calculated, part C of the problem was negative 20 meters per second. This time right here is the total time in the problem. If it took 2.04 seconds to go upwards and 2.04 seconds to go back downwards, this time right here is 4.08 seconds. The 2.04 seconds to go upwards, for example, is right here. So in various portions of the problem, we're looking at the symmetry here, if you will, on this line. Okay, and then as I indicated earlier, the position as a function of time in this problem is described by a parabola. So time in seconds, and now position in terms of meters. What you're seeing here is the following parabola that looks like this. Okay, now here are the various points on this parabola that correspond to the values in the problem. Okay, we start the clock at times t is equal to zero, and then here's the total time of the problem to return back down to the ground, 4.08 seconds. Okay, and then right here is when the object reaches its maximum height. And that's where the vertex of this parabola is that occurs at 2.04 seconds. And then right here is the maximum height that we found earlier in the example in part A. That was 20.4 meters, like so. So we're seeing here throughout this example the basic symmetries involved in position as a function of time and velocity as a function of time. With respect to free fall types of examples, this is as far as we will go here for this class. This then concludes these basic examples here for free fall.